Thank you very much, folk. It's a delight to be with you. The title which I chose for this little address today is Putting Our Stories Together. It's a phrase from Toni Morrison's Beloved. And it will appear again, will this phrase, toward the end of my remarks. When I speak, I usually give what I rather pretentiously call rubrics. These are red letter headings which are intended to help those who are here sort of follow along in the progress of the logic of what I'm saying. And my hope is that you will remember these. If you have a bit of a pen and pencil, even write them down and then come back to them and think on them and, and then perhaps think how much better you would have addressed them yourself had you been doing so. <laughs> the rubrics today are six. And I am told that I must perform what is for me something of a minor miracle. I must finish within the time allotted to me. <laughs> the first rubric is the American project. The American project. Number two, the American paradox. Number three, and toward the heart of what I'm going to say today, of religion and the stages of civic ascent, A-S-S-E-N-T, -S -S of religion and the stages of civic ascent. Number four, a favorite phrase of mine, we can't live what we can't imagine. We can't live what we can't imagine. Right? Number five, and here is the phrase of my title, putting our stories together. And number six, and very briefly, we've got to have some kind of tomorrow. I usually don't when I'm speaking to a subject as now speak of myself. I'm the important matter is the relationship of you to the subject matter. I'm here, but sharing with you. But today, I'd like to begin by speaking a few words about my relationship to this subject. I'm Canadian-born. When I came to this country, I came when I found what I thought to be and still think to be the most exciting social experiment. I will be calling it social project of which I knew in the world's history. I am still fired today by that sense. When I had studied here for a time, I found myself in what I thought to be the most exciting educational project of which I had ever known. Let me mention what I mean now by that. The American project, the, the preamble to the Constitution of this country begins famously, we, the people of the United States, in order to form, and here's the phrase, a more perfect union, and it goes on to establish justice. What caught me, and I hope it catches you, is that phrase, a more perfect union. America, on that understanding, and it continues to be mine, is precisely a project, something thrust forward in time, not yet realized its horizons not even foreseen at the time of the penning of these words. The excitement of that, and I hope you feel it powerfully, is that you in your generation are the voices and you are the doers of the acts which will define what America means in your time as you pass on that which is thrust forward to the future in the discovery of more and wider boundaries of horizons of liberty 
than previously conceived. The American project is not yet finished. Its boundaries have not yet been seen, the ways in which its liberties will be fulfilled. But that leads me to my second rubric, the American paradox. As I came to understand this country, I found it to be one at which, in which, as these words of the nature of the Constitution, the nature of that which brings us together were, were penned, was, as is always the case, something already in motion. It was a country of enormous challenges, a history of the suppression, oppression of native peoples, a history already of African-American slavery, a history which could find itself penned into this very Constitution with the idea that all other peoples than those defined were to be understood as for the purposes of representation and taxation, three-fifths of a free person. The country was already one of deep challenge. And I found it exciting precisely because, though there were those deep challenges, there were the resources intellectually, economic, socially, conceptually, to address them. And then onwardly, as more people came to these shores, people different in race, in language, in religion, to which I shall be turning at the center of my remarks, eh? I understood that that which America was attempting to enact was something of a paradox. When I was a lad, I, I watched from Canada phrases coming from the United States about its own self-understanding. One of the ones that was most powerful, I think it had its use in its own generation, was that America is a melting pot. And the image which came to my mind was one of these great iron cauldrons. Eh? And it was all bubbling in there. And the people who came here were tumbled into this cauldron in all of the diversity. And there was a wee spigot at the bottom and out marched identical little Americans. <laughs> I was rather outraged by this. I thought it probably an uncomfortable process and <laughs> hesitated to come. But I also thought and think it an impossible process. There is a phrase of Augustine's, what, how great is the force of memory, O oh God, says he. How admirable and vast it is. And that thing is the mind, and that thing am I. You can't have identical little Americans, because in order to achieve that, one would have to destroy memory, which is to destroy identity. And so what seemed to be the case is that the American project was involved in the goal of inviting here peoples from all places, all languages, all religions, all races, and allowing them to remain in touch with their memories, their folk ways, and yet, and here's the paradox, somehow forming one society. It is a paradox, and you can't solve such a paradox but one can manage it better or worse in that ongoing project of extending American liberties. And so what shall we do? What protocols will be ours? What the laws which express and regulate our common civic life? Rubric number three of religion and the stages of ascent. Let me begin simply with reference to the three religions which derive themselves from the covenant with Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
Those who are adherents of those religious views, commitments, understand their communities as constituted as the result of a communication by the absolute God of his absolute will. Now, if one is firmly committed to such a view, one, of the communi one who belongs to the communities of commitment, if one is interpreting rightly, one has then the absolute will of the absolute God. And if one has the absolute will of the absolute God, one does not compromise. One does not compromise on what one thinks to be the moral and ethical and social implications of such a situation. But in a plural society like America, on matters which are to regulate our common lives, which includes people of the various other religious commitments and those who do not hold a commitment which they would call religious, the genius of the decision as to the, how we will live in civic unity depends on compromise. And we are, as a nation, on my observation, profoundly confused on this matter. How do we relate, is the question, commitments which may be felt to be absolute to the flexibilities of our common civic life? And let me begin by observing that in principle, at least, from my vantage point, we need to understand that what of our religious commitments we bring to civic discourse about how we will be bound together is that which can be presented as an offering to the public discourse in terms of that which can be discussed and determined by our common reason. It is not the case, I think, that we may present our religious commitments based on a faith commitment to a, to a religious tradition as the grounds for what must, on our view, happen in our communal life. We may present the wisdom of our traditions as we think them to be. We may present the history of the sometimes follies of our religious traditions, but we are presenting our stories. We are presenting that which we expect the others to scan rationally in that common civic discourse. And that which we derive by faith does not have a privileged position in that religious discourse. And we must not try to force on others in laws that which does not derive from the common civic rational consent. One of the problems, it seems to me, and the... One of the problems, it seems to me, is a lack of distinction amongst us in how we urge what we think should be the case on the body politic. Let me try to disengage three stages of what I take to be the levels of assent and consent which should operate. There may be, there may be issues for which I will die before I will consent that they be part of our body politic. There may be issues which I feel, would I like Bonhoeffer? Take, play, take a place in a plot? Or I would leave the country before I could see them accepted. But please, whatever God's may be, these be few. And I not be presented with the 
difficulty of a Nazi Germany. But not all our issues are surely those. There are others which we will advocate urgently, but be willing to live in civil peace with one another in laws which are responsive to a civic consent which does not equate with mine. We needn't feel that we must sublate to that highest level of non-negotiability everything in our common life. And surely there are many things about which we feel we are rather indifferent and can let go in the interest of civic liberty and community and being together as one society in harmony with others. Number four, we can't live what we can't imagine. It's a favorite phrase of mine, and now I want to bring to the level of this great educational project the implications of what I've been saying. We as a university here at Michigan are a place which the public, in this public education, has constituted as a place where we may come together and as part of what we do here, imagine the shape of our future coherence as a society. And we will not succeed, and the society will not succeed unless we have here the memories, the insights, the pains of those, all those who have a major stake in our society. We must not try to ventriloquize for those who are not themselves represented in this civic and educational discourse. And so we must continually find the means to have amongst us those who will contribute their memories to the decisions about our common future, or we will not have their insights and we will not have their consent, their participation, for they have been shut out from it. And there is a great American principle, no taxation without representation, no laws without being part of the civic consensus. Number five. In Toni Morrison's Beloved, putting our stories together is a phrase of enormous importance. It's one in which a terribly injured slave and a terribly injured slave woman who have also injured one another come together after a long and terrible process. And one, the man says to the other, Seth, you put me back together, all the dispersed parts of me, in one good shape. She, me, me. And he says to her, Seth, you're good, you're good. And then Toni Morrison says he wants to put his, and you think you know what's coming. You think you know what a man who is in love wants to put to his woman? <laughs> Toni Morrison knows something more profound even than that. <laughs> he wants to put his story next to hers. And we have sexual drive to help us bring our bodies together. But it's a lot harder, honestly, to put our stories together and to offer them to the civic consensus as free people, two free people, in the use of our reason, bringing us together. And my final phrase, I will leave it with you. Paul Day says to Setha, Setha, we have more yesterdays than anybody I know. We gotta have some kind of tomorrow. And I invite us all then into that civic discourse as free people speaking to free people, basing ourselves in the use of a common reason addressing together not our differences so much as what we can contribute out of our traditions to the common good, offering and not demanding. We gotta have some kind of tomorrow. Thanks so much.